Hello and welcome to the pod. I'm Nathan Fink. I'm Jasmine Torres Allen, and this is New Hampshire Family Now, a show about building family in the Granite State. Today in the podcast, Jasmine and I talk about the intersection of community and pride. Then Executive Director of New Hampshire Housing, Rob Dappis, joins us for a discussion about the state of the housing market for young families. And finally, Director of Impact, Becky Burke, talks NHCT's new data report, and we play Messing with Becky. New Hampshire Family Now is brought to you by the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Since 1962, the Charitable Foundation has worked hand-in-hand with generous and visionary citizens to maximize maximize the power of giving and support, collaborate, and lead innovative initiatives. Initiatives like New Hampshire Tomorrow, which is focused on making sure children and families have access to education, health care, and career pathways to ensure every family member thrives. To learn more about New Hampshire Charitable Foundation and all their initiatives, go to www.nhcf.org. This podcast was also brought to you by Family Support New Hampshire. Family Support New Hampshire is NH's coalition of family resources centers and family strengthening programs that exist to ensure Granite State families have access to resources so both caregivers and children can succeed because supported families are strong families. To find a family resource center near you, visit www.fsnh.org. Hello and welcome to the pod. Jasmine? Yes. I just got a text on the way here from my stepmother who said, I love Jasmine. Oh! That's so great. Yeah. I was on another podcast um, called Mame and Mom and they had listened to to the podcast and, and they were like, I didn't know about this podcast because they they do like New Hampshire moms and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, you guys should tune in more often. Tune in and come on. Yeah, because I am like there's there's obviously a lot of room for a lot of voices, though. The podcast world is crowded. Yes, it's saturated market. But right. it really depends on your audience and like personality wise, because I feel like that's what draw pe- draws people into a podcast. Yeah. It's really the voice and the po- personality of yeah. someone. And and um, the, oh, may, I think it was my wife was saying this, that when she loves a podcast, it feels like she's in the backseat of a car. <laughs> great that's exactly right. it um so anyway <laughs> i think like so now that june is upon us i keep thinking this is the time that in our role in nonprofits we lick our wounds yes. and think about what we could or should do oh yeah we are definitely in that reflection mode of what we should have done in the year what we got done in the year and you know maybe where we could go right right yeah. do you have anything on like in terms of professionally, is there anything that you're looking at saying, all right, this is the June, July and August that I. Ooh, um, I am definitely trying to put together more of what next year is going to look like in terms of what I say yes to. Yeah. I have a tendency to be like, yes, I'm going to do that project. Yes, I'm going to do that project. And then I run myself into the ground. Have you figured out how to say no yet? Actually, a friend of mine last night had told me that there was a, a nicer way to reject, you know, a project or, you know, maybe working with someone. And it w- the phrase was, unfortunately, I can't support that growth right now. Oh my gosh. And I was like, ooh. Ooh, that's a great way to say like, hey, I can't work with you right now or I have to say no to this project and hopefully connect them with someone who can support that. Also, it's a little bit confusing, which is nice. <laughs> like a little bit. Yeah, because I was kind of like, oh, she can't. And I was like, oh, but you're right. It's a lot. It's right. a lot. We're going up. It's a nice, gentle way of, and kind of a vague way of like saying, hey, right now we just can't work together. Yeah. So you're always learning something. I'm always learning something. What are we learning this week? (laughs) Um, This, uh, you know, there's a big project that's coming out. It's called Our Hometown Nashua. I've been working on it for about a year. It's a an award winning series. And the host is Rebecca Rule. And um, it's basically a collection of stories of each town that we go into. I have learned so much about Nashua. It's kind of insane. And now I feel so embedded in the community because all of the people that we spoke to just made me feel so welcome. And seeing them swell with pride as this is coming together and we're coming to the premiere, it just makes me feel like what a great project to bring hometown pride. You know what I mean? Like it's so important to tell stories and storytelling is so important because people feel heard. They feel seen, you know, and 
we archive those stories. I mean, how do we study for the future? We study the past. And so, you know, now we're collecting these stories and they're going to be archived forever. And when we look back on these towns, we'll have these stories of people from, you know, different perspectives and walks of life. Yeah, that's so interesting. Just the idea of like pride, because what is a community but a collection of people who have similar aspirations, right. geographic location and share in the services, the celebrations, the lifelong arc, right? Mm -hmm. But then take that idea of pride because I'm like, oh my gosh, pride as an intentional choice. Right. Right. Like to be proud of where you live. And what happens when you're proud of where you live, you take care of it. You take care of your neighbors. You're mm -hmm. more likely to participate in things. And, and so that's where our hometown really came in. And I saw all of these community members come together. And the coolest thing was like, Hey, how you doing? As they're coming in to tell their stories, like, how are the kids? And, right. you know, so you kind of see those like community ties. And then you hear like the stories of all the organizations and the community volunteers. And you really start to see that people love where they live and they want to take care of it. They want to collectively work to take care of it. I just got chills because it's Pride Month. Right. And I've never considered the idea that pride as an outward and intentionally loud choice mm -hmm. and what that does for a community. Exactly. And so that's why I'm, I've been learning a lot around that storytelling aspect of like, we collected these stories and now we're building building community along with these stories. And it just brings in that, I don't know, that warm feeling that you get of like, you know, wow, this is New Hampshire. Like there's places like this in New Hampshire and that brings you even more state pride. And, you know, it gets, it's, it's funny because the idea of having pride as a choice and having pride in all of it. Right. Yeah. The good, the bad, the ugly is what I say. Like you just got to be proud of, you know, everything and then, you know, push it forward and see. So our hope is that the community feels enough pride to take on the project themselves and say, hey, let's do this again next year or let's get together. Let's do other stories. There's because we collected 52 stories. That's a lot of stories. And there were more. There were so many people that we didn't even get to that we should have gotten to. And that's the thing, though. We want the community to take charge of it. Mm -hmm. Let's collect stories every year and archive those and keep them and be proud of all these people. Um, any particular stories that you can recall that kind of stick in your memory? So funny one was the crew and I were taking a tour uh, with one of the tour guides and at the Abbott House in Nashua, they have this display of a hundred over a hundred wedding dresses of all of the Nashua women over time. And so it was like just beautiful. It's in a beautiful exhibit. And the tour guide walks us in and it was a huge door and the crew and I were kind of like looking at each other and we were like why is there such a big door like why back in the day did they need such a big door and she quietly goes for the hoop skirts and the coffins and we were like, what? And she was like, yeah, the hoop skirts and the coffin. So back in the day, you know, they had funerals in their homes because there weren't funeral homes at the time you, yeah. you were shown in your home. And so you, your door had to be wide enough for a coffin. And then at the time, ladies wore really, really big, you know, dresses, ball gowns, you know, that kind of stuff. And so um, she was like, the door had to be big enough for your hoop skirt to fit, too. Oh and so I was just like, that was the funniest and wildest thing that we created doors for fashion proper entrance and a proper exit yes exactly is there anything else we should know about what's coming down the pike absolutely uh new hampshire pbs is participating in new hampshire gives so if you want to donate um every dollar that you donate will be matched to our ten thousand um, dollar donation that was so generous generously given to us and so any dollar that you could do would be great um and we're still going on with our auction too so if you want to bid on an item, maybe cut some cool stuff, um, you can check out nhpbs.org slash auction. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Jasmine, as always, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and when we come back, we welcome Rob Dappis from New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Don't go anywhere. Many thanks to New Hampshire's Office of Social and Emotional Wellness for sponsoring this podcast. Started within New Hampshire's Department of Education, the Office of Social and Emotional Wellness consolidates policy development and implements projects and programs that are focused on health and wellness with an emphasis on behavioral health of all students, youth, and families. 
To learn more about the Department of Education and its many programs and approaches, visit www.education.nh.gov. Today's show was also brought to you by Burgu Media, a full-service media company dedicated to helping nonprofits realize impact stories for print, video, social, and legacy media, and more. Both budget-conscious and grant-friendly, Burgu Media helps your organization celebrate the humans in human services. Learn more at burgumedia.com. And a quick note before we return to the show, mark your calendars because New Hampshire Gives is right around the corner. June 6th and 7th, Granite Staters turn out in mass to support the organizations that make New Hampshire such a wonderful place for our families. Visit NH Gives where you can search for your local family resource center or other family support programs or even New Hampshire Children's Trust. Because when we strengthen Granite State families, all of New Hampshire succeeds. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. I'm thrilled to welcome Rob Dappas, Executive Director and CEO of New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. Rob, I really appreciate you coming to the show. Good morning, Nathan. Thanks for having me. So I'm fascinated by the work that you guys are doing. Uh, but you know, for those out there who don't know anything about the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, what does it do and how does it function? Sure. I appreciate the question because some people assume that we're a part of the state government and we're not. Some people guess that we're just, a, just some kind of mortgage company and we're not that either. We're sort of uh, in the middle. We're an independent body that was established by state law in the early 80s with the mission to finance and support uh, the creation of affordable housing and housing solutions for the people of New Hampshire. And so we do that through a number of different programs. We finance a lot of multifamily rental housing, and then we have a role in overseeing that housing after it's been financed to ensure that it's being rented to people who are income qualified for affordable rents and, and being well managed. We run home ownership programs that primarily, uh, you know, they're subject to income and purchase price limitations. And so they serve a market that is primarily first time home buyers. And we run the housing choice voucher program for those areas of the state that aren't served by a local housing authority. That's the program that's commonly known as Section 8 and and do a lot of uh, sort of engagement and research work to help inform policymakers on housing issues. You do have children, right? I do. Two girls. For some reason, that becomes a very important question because wherever I turn, I'm constantly thinking about child care and housing in the terms of those two costs for New Hampshire families. So can you give us kind of a state of this state? Where are we currently with housing in New Hampshire? Sure. We're we're in a really difficult place and it's gotten uh, more difficult more quickly than I think a lot of people anticipated. Even those of us who are sort of in the in the business and saw the trends converging and, and what I mean by that is for some time we've anticipated that as baby boomers age but continue to stay in their homes, that's a very large generation by the numbers. And the millennial, millennial generation, uh, you know, I think you and I are maybe on the uh, older edge of that. I'd like to think we're still in it. Yeah. But some of our younger peers perhaps are really in home peak home buying age. And so these two massive generations are demanding in many cases the same type of housing. Uh, at the same time, households have gotten a lot smaller. So even though our population hasn't grown exponentially, our sort of demand for different housing types and particularly smaller smaller housing types has increased substantially over the last decade or two. And so those factors have been conspiring, I guess, to significantly increase demand for housing and the private market simply hasn't been able to keep up. Mm -hmm. The consequence of that supply crisis is an affordability crisis. And so we've seen rents increase to sort of levels that I think we would have considered unimaginable a few years ago. Uh, they've gone up every every one of the last five years. And I think the five-year increase is something in the 30%, 35% range statewide in their pockets that are more substantial than that. Mm -hmm. And home prices, three quick facts that I think stagger a lot of people. But last month, the average home in New Hampshire sold for $450,000. Average mortgage rate for an FHA borrower, which is many first-time home buyers, was 7%. The typical monthly payment at that home price and that mortgage rate, if you include taxes and insurances that are, you know, sort of reasonable on average is 38 to $3,900. And there's just very few families that are going to be able to afford that kind of payment to get into home ownership. No, that's That's a terrifying number right there. You know, and I, I keep thinking about when I, cause I, I'm not originally from New Hampshire. So when I moved, I moved in this pocket of 2015, which is right before this incredible climb, you know, and a, a lot of the research suggested that because because of this quote unquote silver tsunami and then this housing for seniors things that there was going to be a migration towards those single uh, family homes into these kind of larger communes, right? 
opening up the supply, but a number of factors as you had kind of alluded to. So do you have a sense what is driving, say, the desire for the housing? Because COVID caused a lot of migration north. It caused some migration north for sure. And it grabbed a lot of headlines. And there are certain areas of the state where it was especially pronounced. So I didn't mention COVID. You'll notice when you ask me what's going on with housing in New Hampshire. (laughs) Don't get me wrong. It's a factor. But I think it's sometimes misunderstood and people don't remember how tough it was before COVID. And they think that it just got bad because of COVID. Right. Because a bunch of people from New York and Boston moved up north and were able to pay, you know, cash in hand over asking. Right. No question that stuff did happen and is continuing to happen in a few in some cases. But uh, we don't see that as being sort of a catalytic change in the housing market. What is a more substantial change is that as more people are working remotely, at least part of the time, there is greater demand for sort of for larger housing units. And, and so if you're working from home part of the time or your, you know, your partner is, uh, you know, that's going to change your, your needs and your wants in terms of your housing. And so that's increased demand in a way that sort of is not tied to, you know, population growth or household growth, but just simply preferences. So we're watching these numbers, right? And we're watching this kind of disparity between obviously demand and supply. But what can we do about this? Yeah, well, I think uh, hope is not enough, right? We have to take action because it's having serious consequences for both our our population and our families and and also our businesses and our economy. And so, uh, you know, I think the good news is that there are a lot more people who are aware that this is a problem than five or 10 years ago. And so there is talk at the state and municipal level about taking action. And I would divide that action into sort of two categories. One is investments, and there are ways to invest in housing production that serve those people who are most severely affected by the affordability crisis that we're experiencing right now, you know, true affordable housing. And in fact, it's funny when I walked into to your office today, I, uh, some of our partners here in the Concord area, uh, catch housing are, are right in the same building and they've oh, yes. got a long history of developing affordable rental housing. Uh, I think 43 new units that they brought online in Penacook recently at Rosemary's way. And they're doing another project here on the East side of Concord. Um, so organizations like catch are doing a, a wonderful job and we're working with them to provide more affordable housing. And that's really important. However, it's never going to be enough. Uh, I think at the municipal level, you know, that's where most of the barriers exist that have prevented the market from keeping up with demand. And so I think getting involved in finding ways to uh, have more sort of housing friendly policies at the local level is, is the most important thing that most people could do. Yeah. On the solution side, this housing crisis does not, it does not exist in isolation because it's part of the social determinants of health, right? Our housing, our transportation, our employment, all of that. How does NHHFA overlap with some of the other organizations to kind of have cross-sector solutions? Is that part of the thinking? Yeah, I think that's a great question because it is so interrelated with other sort of, you know, I mean, you can think of it as sort of at the sector level, but if you just think of it in sort of uh, at the personal level, you know, there's a common saying, drive till you can afford it. And people sort of say that and take it lightly. But I think it's not insignificant to think about the costs in terms of human health, environmental cost, financial cost of transportation, and, you know, just the time in terms of like what the activities kids are able to do and, and things like that is, uh, you know, of mm-hmm. having really long commutes. And we see that in a lot of areas of the state now. How do we cooperate with other sectors? I think you were asking, and I think work closely. A lot of our partners have great service partnerships with whether it's public health agencies or different kinds of social service providers that provide supports to the people that we serve so that to help them stay stably housed and healthy. In we we allocate resources to create affordable housing according to a qualified allocation plan that goes through a whole public process and the governor signs. And that plan incorporates different characteristics that include proximity to services, transportation, access to public transportation, access to jobs and things like that. Now, the the second part of that question really does have to do with hope and aspirations. And you said before, you know, hope is not enough. Mm -hmm. But when you look at housing, when you look at this sector, what is our hope for housing in New Hampshire? You know, I think one reason that I'm hopeful is that it's not a partisan issue. And the more I talk to people about it, whether they're on the left or right end of the political spectrum, whether they're conservationists or, you know, sort of diehard business people or or both. A lot of people have at this point been personally touched or know somebody who has been personally touched by the housing challenges that the state is experiencing, whether that's something really serious, like struggling with housing stability and Mm -hmm. or something that's sort of 
you know, this, the, I guess the troubles of the affluent people whose adult children have a good income, but, you know, in their, in their 20s, perhaps still haven't moved out because they can't find a place that they can afford. A lot of people realize that there's a need for change and there's a need for more housing and more different kinds of housing in the community. So, you know, I asked you about getting involved at the local level and, you know, how can we? So what do you mean by that, by getting involved? Sure. You know, almost every uh, municipality has a zoning board and a planning board. And those are the volunteers who are making decisions by and large about what gets built and how it gets built in our communities. And a lot of them are are wonderfully dedicated to their community. Um, but I think those processes benefit from more people uh, learning about them and more people getting involved, whether that means volunteering to serve on one of those land use boards or just coming to a hearing and hearing and, and learning a little bit more about it. What we see oftentimes, is that when housing is proposed in a community, often what we see is that the only people who come to those hearings are people who are uh, afraid and opposed to the development. And often those fears are coming from a place of uh, perhaps not being fully informed and certainly not thinking about the benefits to the people who might eventually live in that housing. So coming out and if you see a need for housing in your community and different kinds of housing, uh, speaking up and letting uh, letting your local uh, zoning and planning board members know that I think is a really important thing that we can do for our communities. If people want to learn more, where can they go? So our website has a lot of information on it. That's nhhfa.org. Or actually, if you go to nhhousing.org, that'll take you to our website. Uh, so that has information about our programs, information about finding affordable housing, if that's a situation that you or somebody you know is in. There's also research and reports. And so we recently published the statewide housing needs assessment, which has a ton of fascinating data into it, in it if, you're, if you're into that stuff. Also has a eight page executive summary that tells a really good, uh, understandable narrative of what's, you know, some of the stuff that we've discussed here. We also have a conference coming up. So we run a couple of different conferences each year to sort of bring people together who are working on housing issues and share good ideas. Uh, the, the next one is on June 9th in Portsmouth, our multifamily housing conference. So that'll have a good program of speakers, somebody to talk about sort of the state of the housing economy, uh, and then some panels to talk about uh, best practices in the industry. Now back to the, those daughters. What is the best piece of parenting advice you've ever received? You know. I'm not sure I can remember who gave me this advice, but at some point uh, in w when the kids were uh, really little, I remember being very stressed. Uh, our girls are 19 months apart, so they um, at various times in their lives have fought a lot. And I remember my wife and I, I think, felt like we were just getting it wrong. And somebody, some probably older parent said, as long as you love them and they know that you love them and you're trying to do the right thing, they're probably going to be OK. <laughs> and it's such a basic thing. But I think it sort of took a, a load off to recognize that it's like, just just keep trying. Mm -hmm. Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for the work you're doing here. OK, now just a quick break and then we'll be right back with Becky Burke. This podcast was brought to you by Nixon Peabody, who delivers exceptional legal services for clients in the community by combining high performance, an entrepreneurial spirit, deep engagement, and an unwavering commitment to a culture of collaboration, diversity, and humanity. Nixon Peabody works with universities, hospitals, and nonprofits of every size to maximize impact. For more information, visit nixonpeabody.com. Today's show was also brought to you by Merrimack County Savings Bank, who proudly supports the mission and efforts of New Hampshire Children's Trust. Trust. Founded in 1867, Merrimack has served people, businesses, nonprofits, and municipalities in central and southern New Hampshire for over 155 years by treating everyone with care, respect, and compassion. Visit your local offices in Bow, Concord, Kentuckook, Hookset, and Nashua, or go to www.themerrimack.com. Now, before we go, Director of Impact Becky Burke joins us. Thank God. Anytime you need a straight shooter, Nathan. <laughs> so you heard our interview with Rob Dappas. And uh, I'm wrestling with what do we do with what we heard? Because there's a lot out there in terms of our needs. So take us in there. So what we heard is that housing is a huge issue. It's a concrete need that families have, and it can directly lead to families feeling unstable and out of kilter, right? With right. everything else that they need to do. So I think part of the overview that we just heard is meeting the need in the short term is a critical piece. Hmm. It's not enough. We need to work farther upstream in terms of, of any policy changes that would uh, ameliorate the whole 
issue of housing right. being so stressful for so many families and, and out of reach for so right. many families. And you talk about this a lot, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You put, I mean, housing right at that very foundational base. It is the basis of feeling safe and secure. If you don't have housing, how can you possibly feel, feel safe and secure? And how can you feel like you're you are creating a safe and secure environment for your kids. The reason why it trips me up so much is that as an individual, I feel disempowered with something as big as housing. You know, so you look at that and you say, okay, to correct this thing called housing, it's going to take a group effort, a community effort, a state effort, if not a federal effort to come together, which is quite a bit to move. It's a both and. But this is just one need among the many needs that we're seeing in terms of concrete supports. As reported out by New Hampshire Children's Trust 2022, to prevention impact report. There's so much information that we have now around the short-term pieces that really trip families up. Housing is a huge one. Another one is childcare. Uh, and it's interesting because sometimes people who work in the childcare sector, sometimes people who work in the housing sector, they don't view their work as child abuse prevention. It is totally child abuse prevention. As a matter of fact, um, just earlier this year, a uh, Chapin Hall released some research findings that basically found that difficulty finding childcare is a strong predictor of what will turn into reports of maternal neglect. If there's childcare available, whether it's respite care, whether it's care for a parent to be able to go to work, because often that's the barrier. So housing, childcare, transportation, and most, most of the pieces around transportation were, I need a car to get to my work. I can't afford new tires. The car broke down. I can't afford the registration fees, whatever it is. So often we talk about families being, being one crisis away from catastrophe and one piece creates the smallest little pebble and it turns into a snowball mm. to the extent that we can meet these basic needs before they create additional problems for the family, the better off the family will be and the better off we all will be. Right. It, it's, it's funny you say that with the metaphor with the pebble, because all of a sudden what came to mind is a pearl. You know, these things that start as a grain of sand and then collect and gather mass over time, right? And kind of what is at the center of the pearl? Is it opportunity or is it challenge? And I keep thinking, as I see this data report, we're identifying a lot of the challenges that we know can, can kind of ensconce a family. But we say this all the time, for every challenge, there's an opportunity. The opportunity is always going to be upstream. And what I mean by that is that uh, when when families experience difficulties, uh, when they when they need help, they we as a state, as a social service sector, step in to help. Right. And we are uh, we are pulling families we're pulling children out of the river. Right. How many families do we have to fish out of the river before we go farther upstream mm. and look at the bridge that's going across the river and realize there are no guardrails? Mm. And those guardrails often involve policy. They involve changes in uh, in how we approach this because it's the system that is not working for whatever reason. Right. So often we we try to fix the problem as it presents itself at our door. What we need to understand is that uh, making changes in policy or those upstream pieces is essentially making the greatest change possible for the smallest effort. If you're preventing the problem from happening in the first place, mm. you're saving on the downstream effort, the downstream money, the downstream fixing that is often so problematic for society. Yeah, it's just beneficial. Now, are you ready to play? Oh my God. Messing with <laughs> really? <paper. laughs> Likes data better than people. Here we go again. Way better. Am I the only guest? The that yes is the answer. <laughs> okay. So you know the game in a general sense. Three questions, a blindfold, a big pit. Okay. In this iteration, I give you a challenge from my own life and you give me the opportunity. Wow. Okay. Here we go. So number one, question one. On my 43rd birthday, I get a text from my metabolism that says I quit. What is my opportunity? Your opportunity might be to change your life. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> So like Jasmine, in the first segment of this show, I say yes to everything, being on boards, projects, kids stuff. You know, I will leave a party to go fishing with my kids, as my wife pointed out, if they ask in the right tone, what is my opportunity? Look in the mirror every morning 
and practice saying no. Convince yourself that you're actually saying no. You're the only one who's going to protect your time. That's really good advice. Okay. Now, I'm very open about my recent sobriety. This is a serious question, by Mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. Lately, I've been catching myself wondering if it's worth it. Mm -hmm. I think your opportunity is to redefine for yourself and your family what your core values are, because all of your decisions that you make or choose not to make, right, inaction is also a choice. All of those are really dependent on what you value. Becky Burke, I really appreciate you. Anytime. To download your free copy of the 2022 Prevention Impact Report, visit nhchildrenstrust.org. That's nhchildrenstrust.org. Many thanks to the Samuel P. Hunt Foundation for sponsoring this podcast. Established in 1951, Samuel P. Hunt Foundation is a Manchester-based, independent nonprofit that provides grants primarily for the arts, children and youth services, faith-based organizations, educational institutions, healthcare, and human services. New Hampshire Family Now is listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or ask your smart speaker to play New Hampshire family now.